days become dreary with low hovering clouds of despair. When our nights become darker than a thousand midnights, let us remember that there is a creative force in this universe working to pull down the gigantic mountains of evil, a power that is able to make a way out of no way and transform dark yesterdays into bright tomorrows. Let us realize that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Let us realize that William Cullen Bryant is right. Truth crushed to earth will rise again. Let us go out realizing that the Bible is right. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever the man soweth, that shall he also reap. This is our hope for the future. With this faith, we will be able to sing in some not too distant tomorrow with a cosmic past tense. We have overcome. We have overcome deep in my heart. I did believe we would overcome. This is what the Lord says. They sell the innocent for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They trample on the heads of the poor as on the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. But let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills, and I will bring my people Israel back from exile. Those words that call for justice comes from a little book called Amos, one of the minor prophets. All the people you saw in those videos uh, were people from Shoreline, or in most of the frames, you see people from Shoreline who are seeking to do justice, to help those in need, to love, to serve, to give, to bring the heart of God to a world that's so broken. And the minor prophets, really, they're, they're a cry from the heart of God. And yet the minor prophets are oftentimes missed. There's lots of Christians who have been Christians for a long time. If you say, do you know the minor prophets well? They'd be like, well, I... I've heard of them. I guess they're in the Bible somewhere, but most, most people don't dig into them. I think a couple of reasons that people might miss the minor prophets. Number one, they're small. They're little. If you take all 12 minor prophets and combine all their chapters together, it's 66 chapters. Well, the book of Isaiah, one of the major prophets, is 66 chapters. One book, 66 chapters. That's why it's called a major prophet, because it's bigger. Not that it has major importance. It's all God's word. But the major prophets are bigger, the minor prophets are smaller. I think we miss them because they're small, but I think we also miss the minor prophets because they pack a punch. The minor prophets just bring it straight. I mean, they just say, this is the heart of God. They only have a little time to say it. They're only a couple chapters or a few chapters long, so they get right to the point. I like, I'm, how many of you are people that when you're talking with someone, you, you, you're kind of that temperament like, Get to the point. Anybody else like me? You're sort of a get to the point person. There's times where things are lingering and I'm like, okay, just say it. I don't say that because I'm a pastor and I'm gentle, but I think it sometimes, you know. And so the minor prophets, they just get to the point. When I first became a Christian, I was 15 years old. And that summer I became a Christian, uh, I read, I, I, someone gave me a Bible. And I, I, so I read through it. When I got to the minor prophets, they were confusing because there's such, such a different time in history. They, they, they're written maybe 2,500 years ago to 3,000 years ago in a whole different part of the world and a whole different time in history. So I'm reading these minor prophets. They're getting to the point quickly, but I'm not always getting the point. So I said to somebody, is there something that will help me understand what the Bible says about these different things? And they said, oh, they said, well, have you ever, ever read a commentary? I said, what's a commentary? They said, well, it's a book about the books of the Bible. And I got my very first commentary on the minor prophets. I have hundreds of commentaries now, but this is my very first, this is the very, it's very dear to me, my very first commentary. I went to a bookstore and bought this. Thankfully, it's a good, solid biblical uh, scholar who wrote this, and it really helped me understand the minor prophets the first time I read through them, but I've gone back to them again and again and again. Uh, when, we, when we did a series last year called Major Lessons from the Minor Prophets, uh, at the end of that series, we went through about half the minor prophets. People said, 
well, when are we going to do the rest of the minor prophets? And here's the answer. Now. Okay, we're starting today. And we, and we used a little format last time that people really, they, they expressed their appreciation for. So we're going to have three different locations. So whoever's preaching, I'm doing most of the, the sermons, but whoever's preaching uh, in this area here, we'll be focusing on the history, the background, the setting, the stuff like you'd find in the commentary that say, well, here's where it's happening. This is what's going on in the world. So when you read the message, it makes sense within that historical setting. So here we'll kind of talk about the background and who is the prophet and what was the setting. When, when, when the, the, the preacher moves over here, we're talking about the major lessons. What are like the big heart lessons that come from that prophet? And then over here, it's going to be more of a conversational time. We're asking the question, what if that prophet were sitting with you today? What would that prophet say to you? So we're looking at Amos today. What would Amos have to say if he was like having a conversation with just an ordinary person in our world today? And I hope at that time you can, you can hear that message and you can get it with clarity. I'm going to move these out of the way because when I'm sitting over here, I don't want to block you over there and I want to be able to see everybody as I'm, as I'm teaching. So, so we're going to begin on the book of Amos over here and just to kind of get the setting, get the context. And if you were to meet Amos, if you had a chance to meet the prophet Amos, you would notice a couple things right away. Amos had dirt under his fingernails. How do I know this? Because he was a farmer. Amos's, uh, Amos's hands were stained because he farmed the sycamore fig trees, and when you harvested sycamore figs, it was the food of the poor, and when you harvested it, you would get stained hands. He was a shepherd and a farmer. He wasn't professionally trained in religion as a prophet. He was an ordinary guy. Picture, picture a prophet in overalls. Picture a prophet who's just an ordinary guy. This is what Amos said about himself in chapter 7 of Amos, verse 14. He said, I was neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I was a shepherd, and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. He's telling you who he is. He's just saying, I'm just, I wasn't trained in this. I didn't plan on this, being a prophet, but God called him. He lived in a little town called Tekoa, which was about seven miles away from Bethlehem. Well, Bethlehem, even though we hear a little, old little town of Bethlehem at Christmas songs, Bethlehem was a small town. Tekoa was like a smaller town outside of a small town. So he was kind of from Nowheresville, no formal background, no formal training, and his name meant burden bearer, the one who bears a burden. And Amos bore a burden, a massive burden, because God called him to go to people who didn't want to hear what he had to say and bring a message they didn't want to hear as an uneducated, non-professional clergy member. Rough call, he, but he bore the burden and he bore it with dignity and he bore it with strength. And Amos went toe to toe and head to head with the religious leaders of his day and the political leaders of his day to speak the truth of God. And I believe that the message he brought them in their day, almost 2,800 years ago, we need just as loudly today. To understand Amos also, you have to understand that kind of the, what was happening in the world at that time. So if you look up here at the screen, you're going to see uh, this is uh, when God's people uh, went into the Holy Land and they went to the Promised Land, they took this area here with, with the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea and the Jordan River, and here's the Mediterranean Sea, and this area was the Holy Land, and all 12 tribes of God's people lived there together in peace for 120 years. They lived there under King Saul and then King David and then King Solomon, for 120 years, they were united as a kingdom, and they were doing fine. Then there's this massive civil war. I mean, just conflict. And the dividing line was right here. And up here, 10 of the tribes in the northern kingdom kept the title Israel, were the people of Israel. Samaria was their capital. And two of the tribes were down here in the southern kingdom, where Jerusalem was the capital. And this was the dividing line. And really, in this time, you didn't cross that line. If you're up in the north and you're part of Israel, you stayed up there. If you're down in the south and part of Judah, you stayed there. They had their own places of worship. They had their own capitals. Massive civil war that, that, that lasted for hundreds of years. And, and so that's the environment that Amos is ministering. Now, here's what you got to get. Amos is from the southern kingdom. And God calls him to go and prophesy up in the northern kingdom. To cross the border. To go into enemy territory. And not just to go there, but to go to the main sanctuary in Bethel, which was the sanctuary of Jeroboam II, who was the king of Israel at that time. He went to the king's sanctuary to prophesy. So he would not have been at least initially welcomed with open arms and an open heart. 
But, but this is the setting, this is the environment that, that Amos walks into. And so he's coming as a kind of a nobody in the world's eyes, without formal education, stained hands, clearly a farmer of sycamore fig trees. He's, he's walking into an environment where he's not welcome, he's not invited, he's crossed the border into enemy territory, and now here he is getting ready to prophesy. So what message does he bring? What, what are the major lessons, the major messages that God speaks through the heart of Amos, not just to the people of Israel, but Israel, Judah, and the surrounding nations? Well, if you're a note taker, you'll see there's a place to write down five main lessons. I'm going to give you the first four. The fifth one will be a mystery. And so if you want to know the fifth one, check with me after the service. And you can, if you need to fill in the blanks, talk to me. I'll give you the right things to fill in there. But let, here's a major lesson from Amos, number one. We'll find this in chapters one and two of the book of Amos. If you have your Bibles, open to Amos chapter one, and I want to show you a few things that are there. Here's major lesson number one. God sees injustice and will deal with it, including ours. God does not like injustice. And, and, and it's easy to notice injustice in other people's lives. It's hard to see it in ourselves. Well, now you have to understand that, that, that when Amos goes up, up into the northern kingdom, he goes to Bethel, he goes to, to this worship place, that, that's sort of the central place of worship in, in that part of the world. When he goes there to preach, you have to understand he's in the ancient world and it's predominantly a Jewish context. So when somebody would preach at that time or teach or prophesy, people would interact. If people agreed with you, you knew it. If people disagreed, you knew it. Now, we're in a little different culture here. I'm preaching and nobody's saying anything, but there's some church settings where people will say, yeah, pastor, go on, pastor, and they'll agree. I'm not encouraging you to do that. I'm just saying there's some places where that happens. And also, there's places where if people don't agree, they'll let you know. In his context, that's how it would have been. So he starts out his message, and this is a message of a call to justice. And so if you look with me, if you have your Bibles open to Amos chapter 1, you'll notice that in verses 3 through, verse, uh, verses three through 5, He's talking, he says this, and, and this is the refrain, this is kind of the prophetic refrain that comes up again and again. This is what the Lord says, for three sins of Damascus, even for four, I will not relent. And God says, I, I see there's for three sins, for four sins, God says, I'm not gonna hold my hand back, I'm not gonna relent, I'm bringing judgment, why? Because of their injustice. And he goes on to talk about how they, their warfare was brutal, they would completely destroy cities, and he explains why God's bringing judgment on Damascus. Now, D Damascus is the, the center of the Aramean world at that time, and this is one of the enemies of Israel. So here's what happens. Amos gets up to prophesy, and he starts by saying, listen, for three sins and for four of the capital of Damascus, of the Aramean kingdom, who was an enemy of Israel, it's, a, it's, not, it's not Israel or Judah, it's another nation, and Amos says, for all their sins and for all their justice, he says, judgment is coming on them from God. And the people of Israel there in, in, the, in, in the worship place of Bethel would have gone, yay, get them, God, they're unjust, they should get it. And, and they, they would have said, as, as he's preaching, he says, this foreign nation who's your enemy has been unjust, and they knew that, they knew they were a very unjust nation, and says, God's judgment is coming. And they would have been thrilled and happy. So that now they're thinking, oh, maybe this prophet from, you know, from the southern kingdom, maybe he's okay, he's against, our, you know, he's against our enemies, and he's declaring God's against them. So they'd be happy about this. Then he goes on. And in verse 6, this is what the Lord says. For three sins of Gaza, even for four, I will not relent. Because she took captive whole communities, sold them into slavery. Talks about their injustice. Another nation outside of their own who was one of their enemies. And they're going to get judged for their injustice. And the people would have gone, yay, God, get them. They're bad. They're unjust. And they would have seen their injustice. And the people of Israel would have been verbal. This, go get them, God. And then it goes on to Tyre, to Edom, to Ammon, to Moab, city after city, region after region, says God's justice, just judgment is coming on those people, and they would have been thrilled. Then you get to verse four of chapter two, and now it gets really interesting, because here's what Amos says. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Judah, even for four, I will not relent, because they rejected the law of the Lord. They've not kept his decrees because they've been led astray by false gods. And he gives a list of the sins of Judah. Now, who's Judah? His own people. He's a prophet from Judah. He lives in Judah. He's among the people of Judah. He's from the southern kingdom in Judah. And he starts to prophesy against his own people, the people that they're in a civil war with. So now they're going, yay! Let them have it, Amos! You know, they're thinking, we love this prophet. He came up here to our land to prophesy against his own people. 
and their injustice. And the people of Israel would have been saying, yeah, they are unjust. And, and, and been thrilled that God was going to judge. But he's not done yet. Now Amos has talked about the injustice of the nations around them. He's talked about the injustice of Judah down in the south. Who's next? If you have your Bibles open, you already know. Amos 2, 6, and 7. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not relent. He's in the middle of Israel. He's a foreign prophet from down south. And he says, for three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not relent. For they sell the innocent for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. Human slavery. They trample on the heads of the poor as on the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. Father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name. They lie down besides every altar on garments taken in pledge, pagan worship. In the house of their God, a false God, they drink wine taken as fines. No cheers. Amos is talking about them. Their rebellion, their disobedience, their injustice, their sins. And he lays it bare. We have great perspective on seeing other people's injustice and other people's wrongs. We have terrible perspective on seeing our own. And Amos says, God is a God of justice and he deals with it when there's injustice. Not just theirs, but whose? Ours. I think this is one of the reasons that some people avoid books like Amos. Because it comes like a knife and cuts into our souls and shows us the need for change and transformation. Major lesson number two from Amos. You find this in chapters four and five of the book of Amos. God's longing and desire is to see us repent and turn to him. When God sees us living in injustice, when God sees us turning our hearts from him and not walking closely with him, injustice towards other people, injustice towards God. When God sees that, God's desire is for us to repent. What does it mean to repent? It means we're heading one direction, the wrong direction, a dangerous direction where we shouldn't be going, and this is repentance. We stop, we turn around, and we go the right direction. And God does all he can to warn us. If we're driving towards a cliff, God says, turn around and come back. He does all he can to warn us. Listen to these words from Amos 4, verses 7 and 8. God says to the people, I also withheld rain from you when the harvest was still three months away, right when they needed rain. I sent rain on one town, but withheld it from another. One field had rain, another had none and dried up. People staggered from town to town for water, but did not get enough to drink. In a culture where water was life, God said, I actually held back water from you. Listen to this. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. What's he saying? God says, I'm trying to discipline you. I'm trying to catch your attention. I'm withholding water so you'll return to me, so you'll repent and turn from your injustice and from your hearts being far from me. But he says, you didn't, you just kept going. God says, you're heading towards a cliff, you're pressing the gas, you're going full speed, you're heading to destruction, and God says, I'm warning you. I'm setting up flares, I'm putting up roadblocks, and you're blasting through the roadblocks. I'm setting up flares, and you're ignoring them. And if you, if you have your Bible open, or if you have a, an app in front of you, you can mark these verses in chapter 4, verse 6, 8, 9, 10, and 11, it says the same thing every time. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. God says, I tried this warning, you didn't return. I tried this warning, you didn't return. I tried this warning, I tried to get your attention. I said, stop, you're going you're gonna to kill yourselves. You're, you're going to hurt other people. And God says, I'm warning and warning, and you just ignored me and blast right through. And Amos says this to us. God's longing and desire is to see us repent and turn to him. When he sees you heading towards disaster, he warns. And sometimes his warnings are even harsh to get our attention. And he says, but you just kept pushing through and you never stopped. And that's a word for them, but that's also a word for us. Major lesson number three from Amos. Amos chapter six. Looking the other way and ignoring injustice is a form of injustice. You hear that? Looking the other way and ignoring injustice when it's in front of us is a form of injustice. You know what a lot of people say when it comes to injustice? 
Here's what they say. Hey, I didn't do anything. And God says, exactly. You didn't do anything. And sometimes when we do nothing, that is injustice. When we see something that's wrong, and we say nothing, and we do nothing, and the Holy Spirit of God is saying to his children, say something, do something, help, anything. You can't do everything, but do something. And when we say, well, I didn't do anything. God says, yeah, there's times where doing nothing is injustice, because you could do something. You could do your part. You can't fix everything. You can't heal everything. You can't correct every injustice, but there are injustices that you see that you can do something about. And the Holy Spirit says, do it. But oftentimes, we just keep going, doing our thing. Listen to Amos 6, 1 and following. Woe to you. Anytime you hear the word woe in the Bible, it's serious. Woe to you who are complacent in Zion. Zion is Jerusalem, the capital of the southern kingdom. And to you who feel secure on Mount Samaria. So he's talking to the capital of the southern kingdom and the capital of the northern kingdom. He's saying, woe to you, my people, who are complacent, who feel secure, you notable men of the foremost nation to whom the people of Israel come. Now listen to this. You lie on beds adorned with ivory. You lounge on your couches. You dine on choice lambs and fattened calves. You strum away like David on harps and improvise on musical instruments. You drink wine by the bowlful and you use the finest lotions. But you do not grieve over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, you will be among the first to go into exile. Your feasting and your lounging will end. He says, listen, you're fine. You're comfortable. You don't have any real big needs. And you become so comfortable that you're doing nothing. And he says, that breaks the heart of God. And he's not saying that we, each person has to do everything, but I do believe that God says, if you're my child and you love me, and I show you something that's wrong or unjust, and you say nothing, do nothing, and look the other way when I'm calling you to do something, that in and of itself is a form of injustice. And then major lesson number four. God's heart breaks when his people lift up their hearts, hands, and voices in worship, and also engage in injustice or ignore injustice. God's heart breaks when he sees his people and who they are on Sunday looks nothing like who they are Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. God's heart is broken when he sees his people lift their hands in worship and then use those same hands to oppress people. God's heart is broken when he hears us lift our voices in praise and then use our words to tear people down. There needs to be consistency in who we are. So listen to these words from Amos chapter 4 and chapter 5. This first passage in Amos 4, 4, and 5 is almost, God is almost speaking with tongue in cheek. Uh, he, he's speaking, he, he's making a reverse point, and you'll get it in the tone. God says this, go to Bethel, which is the king's sanctuary. Go to Bethel, this worship place, and sin. So God's saying, go to church and sin. Go to Gilgal and sin yet more. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three years, burn leavened bread as a thank offering, and brag about your free will offerings. Their worship had become about themselves. Boast about them, you Israelites, for this is what you love to do, declares the sovereign Lord. He says, your worship is no longer worship, it's about yourself. Then look at chapter five of Amos, verses 21 to 24. This is God speaking, and he says this, I hate I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies stink. They're a stench to me, God says. For even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. Why? Well, we find out in verse 24. But let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. You get the point? God says you're going through religious routine, but your life looks nothing like Jesus. You're going to church, but who you are for that hour and 10 minutes looks nothing like who you are the rest of your week. Now, the point is not 
don't go to church and don't worship. The point is, get your life consistent. Let, let your voice that lifts up and gives praise to God be a voice that speaks out on behalf of God in our world. Let your hands that give offerings to God also be a hand that helps the person in need. God is saying it's more than just an hour a week. It's more than just a religious observance. It's all of who you are. It's your whole life. That's the heart of God. And God is concerned that we not just go through the motions. God is concerned that we not let injustice rule our lives while we speak of justice and speak of grace and compassion and mercy on Sunday, but it doesn't look like the rest of our lives. So if Amos could show up here today and pull you aside and just, and just uh, have a seat and speak to you and speak to me, what would be the heartbeat of this prophet for the church today? What would be the heartbeat of the prophet for our world today? And the first thing I think that Amos would say is this, and I think this is an important message, and it's, it comes from the heart of Amos. I think Amos would say this, don't say God can't use someone like me. Don't say, I don't have the education. I don't have the background. I'm not wealthy. I mean, Amos would sit here and say, let me tell you where I came from. I come from a town just left of Nowheresville. I came with no formal training. I came with stained hands so everyone knew I was just a farmer. And the God of the universe called me to bring a challenging, world-impacting message to one of the most powerful leaders of that time, to Jeroboam II at his, at his place of worship in a place I didn't want to go to bring a message that was hard to bring. But I was faithful. And you know what? We're still sitting here talking about it today. That's how God used someone like Amos. I think Amos would look at you and say, I don't know what your excuse is for why God can't use you. But Amos would say, I had more. <laughs> and God used me. God can use whoever he wants. Be available and ready for God to use you and to work in you. What would the prophet say to you? Here's the second thing. Search your heart and deal with the injustice that lives there. I think Amos would say to you and me, search your heart and look for injustice that's there. That there's not one of us here today who is perfect in how we treat those who are broken and hurting and oppressed and far away from God's love and grace. I think Amos would say, look at your heart and say, are there places where I treat people unfairly, where there's injustice in my words, in my actions? What does my life look like and how can I surrender my life more to the God who loves me, to the God who is a God of justice, to a God who wants justice to pour like a never-ending stream and you can be part of that flow of justice. Could you imagine if every person who's part of Shoreline, you know, two or 3,000 people today that are gonna hear about the justice in the heart of God. And if every one of us would say, this week, I can't do everything, but I will notice one or two times where there's something unfair that isn't right, that isn't just. When the Holy Spirit stirs my heart, I will say something, do something, give something, love in some way, and let God use me. That's what Amos would say. Let God pour through you. Number three, what would the prophet say to you? Don't blast through the roadblocks and warning signs God puts in your path. He watched a whole nation of people just blast through all of God's warnings and not turn around. And I think Amos would say, listen, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you've come to the cross and received Jesus, the Holy Spirit lives in you. And the Holy Spirit, throughout your day, throughout your week, throughout your month, is saying, stop doing that. If your husband knew, if your wife knew, if your kids knew, it would ruin your life. Stop. And the Holy Spirit convicts, and we just blast right past it. And there's times where God moves us to show compassion and to help other people and to become generous. And we, we feel like we want to, and all of a sudden, we just blast through. The Holy Spirit's challenging us, and we just blast through and keep living like we're living. I think Amos would say, don't keep blasting through the roadblocks. Don't keep ignoring the warning flares. Pay attention when the Holy Spirit says, stop speaking that way, living that way, acting that way. Clean that out of your heart. Stop being that. When the Holy Spirit speaks and gives those warnings, take them seriously. Because what God is saying is, you're heading for a spiritual cliff. I don't want to see you go off the edge. And he's speaking truth to help us repent and turn around and follow him. What would the prophet say to you? Open your eyes to the injustice in your home, community, and wherever God has placed you, and do something. Do something. Do your part. I think Amos would say, there's something you could do. And we get caught up in the fact that we can't fix everything, but we can do something. 
In the next couple of weeks, as a church, we're going to share with you how we're strategizing and preparing for the next 6, 9, 12 months to help people in the United States, along the southern part of our country, for, that have gone through all kinds of natural disasters. I will guarantee you, in a week and a half to two weeks from now, all those things will be off the radar of the news cycle. That's all it talks about now, but there'll be the new thing, whatever the hot new thing is, whatever the topic is, whoever said something stupid or done something wrong or whatever tragedy is coming, we're going to be there, and everyone's going to forget about that part of the country. But the heart of God would say, help those. In the-. These are people who didn't ask for this, didn't do anything wrong. They happen to live somewhere where there's a tragedy. We're going to strategize as a church. Our whole outreach team is working to say, not how do we just show up tomorrow and help for a week and be done with it, but how do we, over the coming year, help people that are going to need help for a long, long time? How can we give? How can we pray? How can we go and help? And there'll be something that God will stir your heart for. Then when that chance is there, do something. Engage in that. I think that God would say to us, and Amos would say, do what you can do. Number five, what would the prophet say to you? Make sure the church you is the everyday you. Make sure you're the same person. Who you are on Sunday, who you are at church, needs to be the same person you are all the time, wherever you go. I think Amos would say, listen, don't don't let this person that you are for a little bit of time on a Sunday be a rarity. Let this be who you are all the time. I think Amos would say, listen, when you're here, your language is oftentimes different. Your your heart is warmer. There's there's a care. There's a generosity that should mark who you are. And for some people, there's, there's... They're pretty close. For some people, they're totally different, and you're different places in the journey. But more and more look and say, is who I am when I have a sense I'm standing before God, among God's people, is that person with love and care and compassion and generosity, is that who I am all week long? And bring those together. God sent an ordinary guy into enemy territory to bring a hard message And I think sometimes the minor prophets get missed because they just come and go, here's the truth. They only have one chapter, three chapters, six chapters to say it, so they just bring the message with clarity. And we worship a God who loves and cares about everyone, even those who haven't named the name of Jesus. And he says, when you can do justice, when you can bring mercy, when you can show compassion, do your part And through that, God will bring his glory and his presence from where we are to the ends of the earth. Oh God, we pray together right now. As we prepare to just close our service singing together and just worshiping you and reflecting on these truths, we pray, Lord, that you'll speak to our hearts. That these words from Amos will not just bounce off a hard heart, will not kind of skim over the top of our head and go, and we hope it hits somebody else. We pray that there'd be a message for us. And as we sing together right now, God, would you speak to our hearts As we sing together, would you speak and let us know if we need to be courageous to be used by you, even though we think we're not, uh, maybe something that could be useful in your hands. As, as, As we sing together, would you speak to us about any injustice in our hearts or our lives? Would you speak to us about what we could do? Lord, let the let these songs of worship be a time for your Holy Spirit to minister in us so that we leave here changed. Different people, more loving, more compassionate, but taking action to show the just grace and mercy of God for those in our home, our neighborhood, right here in our community, throughout our nation and to the ends of the earth. Speak to our hearts. 